Hi, this is the Magnificent Midlife Podcast and I'm Rachel Lancaster. This is where we celebrate women in midlife and beyond. We challenge the status quo and bash those negative stereotypes about being an older woman. We're not over the hill at 40, 50, 60. We're just getting started. And the world needs us now more than ever. I'll be talking all things midlife, about issues that matter, and sharing fabulous stories of amazing women doing very cool stuff. Now is our time. I'm very excited to be interviewing Dr. Sharon Blackie today. Sharon is an award-winning writer, psychologist, and mythologist. She is focused on the development of the mythic imagination and on the relevance of myth, fairy tales, and folk traditions to the personal, cultural, and environmental problems we face today. She's the author of the best-selling If Women Rose Rooted and most recently Haggitude, Reimagining the Second Half of Life, which I absolutely loved. So welcome, Sharon. Thank you, Rachel. It's lovely to be here and to be talking with you. So I discovered your book because we were both on the list from the Bookseller magazine as being books to read about menopause. And I thought, this looks so interesting. And when I read it, there were so many parallels to what I've been thinking about and all of this, but I hadn't made that connection to the traditional archetypes to archetypes of women, the historical figures of womanhood. So I just want to ask, why did you feel you needed to write this book, Haggitude? Well, the nature of my work is with myth and with story. So anything that I write is always going to be centered around that. And as a psychologist practicing back in the day, not any longer, it was very clear to me with the people that I was working with, that you clearly have to capture people's imagination in order to spark off lasting and meaningful change. And a story can always do that. You can always help people see what is possible, what might be achieved, and and also what has gone wrong by using a story. It never fails. And so when I looked at the range of books that there were out there about menopause and growing into elderhood, there are some wonderful books But I was looking for something a little bit different. I was looking to actually offer people up pictures, stories about what it might mean, what it might look like to live a meaningful life in in the second half of life. Um, So it was a little bit different from, uh, you know, uh, most of the other very wonderful books out there that that deal with slightly different issues or aspects of menopause. It's completely different. And that's what I that's what I loved about it. I thought mine was different. I had a right mind because I didn't like a lot of what was being written about women getting older and the fact that we still had to apologize for getting older and we're not supposed to be infertile. The world doesn't know what to do with us when we're not fertile anymore. Um, But your book just takes it to another level. And that's what I loved about it. And, And it was so interesting to learn about the hags, to learn about the archetypes. And, you know, I know about them, but to actually experience them in the way that you write about them. So tell us about hags. What is it about hags that that delights you? Well, the word delights me, actually, for a, for a start. And I know it doesn't delight everybody. But if you look at the myths and folklore, and I focus very much on European folklore, but, you know, my own traditions. If you look at the stories where women are referred to as hags or presented as hags, they are stories about women who are not defined in relationship to anybody or anything else other than themselves. Uh, They're not defined as somebody's wife, somebody's grandmother, somebody's daughter, or any of that. They are just there presenting themselves and their unique way of being in the world and their unique gift that they bring to the world. And that's what I really liked, because it seems to me that elderhood is very much about finding out who we are when we drop away all of the kind of contraptions and um, relationships that have defined us in the past. And that's what these women do in all of those stories. So they're not always the main character in the story. In fact, they're very rarely the main character in the story. The main characters are normally golden-haired princesses and handsome princes. 
but you can almost always find an old woman somewhere pulling the strings, making the action happen, seeing the pattern of the narrative and what might go right and what might go wrong and what the heroine or hero needs to succeed. And they do it, as I said, entirely of themselves. And how did you come to be so interested in them how did you how why mythology how what what happened to grab that and make that such an important part of your life ever since I was a child I think growing up in a complex and often difficult environment and retreating into stories and the the characters that I loved as a young child were always the old women and particularly the solitary old women in the woods. I did not see myself as a golden haired princess. I, I, you know, I grew up on a council estate in the northeast of England. Th those heroines didn't seem to relate to me and my life at all. And I liked the idea that or the fact that in the stories, it was the old women who always knew what was going on. And so it began from there, really. And when I went into psychology, I fell into narrative practice um, so that all of my work was based around helping people construct and deconstruct the, the narratives of their life to reimagine themselves through fairy tale techniques. And it's just never been. And then, of course, I, my first book was a novel. So I, I am a fiction writer first and foremost. And so it's never been it's never not been a part of my life, I suppose. But I suppose for many people, and, and myself included, I suppose it's been very much a sideline, whereas for you it's become, it's the focus of your life and then it's expanded into other areas by taking inspiration from that. I mean, I, I confess before I hit record that I haven't read all of If Women Rose Rooted, but I started it and I made the awful sin of going to the end because I knew I was interviewing you and I wanted to know more about it. And that feels to me, it's like this call to arms, isn't it, for women? And again, using archetypes, looking at mythology, looking at women's relationship to the land, to the earth, that we have lost that connection. And I think you and I, we share this distaste for the way Western society treats older women now, and we want to do something to reframe that. But one book leads on from the other. But I, I don't know where, quite where I'm going with this, but I'm just so interested that it's, well, it's made this connection for me that I never had before. And I'm now thinking about things in different ways. And I have felt myself wanting to reconnect with the earth. Nature, mother nature is much more important to me now, even though I live in a big city, I live in London, you know, but going into nature is so important. And yet it seems to have been your life. It seems to have been that that has been the focus of who you are and the way you live your life. Not always, I would say. When I was a child, yes, but like everybody, or like not like everybody, like many of us, I lost it as I went into adult life, and it took me a long time to find it again, which is kind of the journey that I write about in If Women Rose Rooted. But the, but the two books are similar in the sense that, yes, they're both looking at these very powerful female characters either in our native British and Irish mythology, in the case of If Women Rose Rooted, or in the wider European mythology, in the case of Hagitude. And they're pointing out the, the fact that, you know, these are not twinkly sky goddesses. They're not. You know, they're storm <laughs> hags. Um, they're imminent in the land. They're dancing across the mountaintops. They're running around, followed by herds of wild pigs. They're they're in the sea, you know, that they are absolutely creatures of the land. And what many of the characters tell us, and one character in particular who is my favourite in the whole world, a character called the Kaliach, uh, literally means the old woman in um, Gaelic mythology of, of Ireland and Scotland and to some extent the Isle of Man, is absolutely a guardian and protector of the land as well. So not only is she the creator and shaper of the land, but she stops, for example, hunters from taking too many deer or from taking pregnant deer in season. And so th this image of the woman as profoundly associated with the natural world is really 
they're everywhere. But what is interesting in our mythology as well is that the natural world and the other world are not separate. You know, the other world is not some transcendental out there place. It's kind of enveloped in the natural world. It's almost like another way of seeing. You know, you 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 look at a rock and let's say there's a veil between you and the rock and you manage to pierce the veil. Then you see that the rock is alive, that there is a, you know, that there is animacy in the rock and, and it's all intertwined. And so to say that a woman is deeply connected with the land is also to say that she holds the moral authority of the other world. She understands how it all works and how it has happened that we have never in these countries of ours looked at these stories in the way that, that I have tried to do in these two books is quite astonishing. Because if we look at Native American mythology, we find exactly the same thing, but everybody knows about it. Everybody treats it as a kind of cosmology, you know, as a worldview, as a way of being. Here, we treat those stories as just fairy tales for kids, and we don't see them in the same way. And I guess it's my passion to try to help people to see them in, in that way. Well, that certainly comes across. I mean, I... I feel you've opened a door for me and I'm just going to walk through it and I'm going to find out all sorts of exciting and interesting <laughs> things that I can then apply because that's what you do, isn't it? You're, you're creating a toolkit, but it's a totally alternative toolkit, although it shouldn't be the alternative. What we've got should be the alternative and yours, I think, should be the one that we start with, but it's not that way, is it? Because we, sure. we've gone so far away from... What is... We have gone very far yeah. away. And I think the problem really is for a lot of people who would like to change and to live in a way that's different, that's more meaningful, that's more earth centered, is they often don't know how. And again, that's where the stories come in, because if stories do anything, they help us to reimagine ourselves and they present us with different ways of being in the world. They present us with ways of being that are useful and meaningful in a world that is completely broken. I mean, look at your average fairy story. You know, it doesn't start well generally. And so you've got these characters going on in spite of incredible odds against them and somehow finding a solution and always, always, always finding it with the help of others. Often an old woman, but sometimes an animal or a tree or a talking horse's head or whatever it might be. And they just help us to see, I think, possibilities. I don't mean clearly in a literal way, um, but they help us just to, the images in them, the characters in them just stick with us and they ignite something that makes us want to look at the possibility of change. And is that what you mean by mythic imagination when you when you talk about that? Kind of, yeah. I mean, to me, the mythic imagination is, it, it's lots of different things. That's part of it. It's also about walking through the world and seeing something beyond the obvious. For example, we all have crows, right? Everybody has crows around them. I've started um, talking to crows now. Good. You've made, you've made me do... <laughs> there you go. I've succeeded in something really important. But a crow, you know, we know what a crow is. It's a blackbird. It has a particular sound. It likes a particular habitat. It has particular behaviours. It eats this. You know, we can all look at what a crow is in its physical context. But if I look at a crow... I see that, and the physical context is absolutely critical to understanding the bird, but I see that overlaid with all of the stories of, of Celtic mythology which show shape-shifting crow goddesses, you know, and the crow is a trickster character who allows us to see the other world in a particular way. So it's kind of like a layer on top of the purely physical that helps me love crow more, want to talk to crow more, understand crow's niche not just in the ecology, but in the kind of, you know, wider world. And it's just, it's just more interesting. <laughs> it makes the world a more interesting place. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of the mythic imagination as well. You know, that ability to layer on top of the physical, these kind of images and symbols and myths and stories. Interesting. So I know there's a, a very interesting little story about how you came up with the title. Would you like to share that with my listeners? Yeah, I mean, it's not very interesting. It's just a bit weird, really. I think so, it is. <laughs> so, I, well, I just woke up one night in the middle of the night and I sat up upright and I just said hackitude, you know, to the bedroom, as you do, uh, in the middle of the night. And then I promptly went back to sleep again. And oddly, in the morning, I remembered the word. I remembered 
sort of sitting up and saying the word. And I thought, well, that would be the great, a great title for, for another book. And then the idea of Hagitude came to me. And to me, you know, because I love that concept, as I've explained about the hag as absolutely entire unto herself, she doesn't need anybody else to define her. That whole concept of Hagitude, a kind of Hagitudinal attitude, I suppose, just seemed to be something that older women really need in order to break free of all of the stereotypes that you were mentioning earlier and to actually see how we could create an image of elderhood that suits us and suits our unique gifts and our ways of being in the world. So what are the things that you hate about how women are present, how older women are presented currently, especially in our culture? I think the fact that they are mostly not only trivialized, but actively ridiculed, you know, I think that I don't mind the invisibility. I quite like that. That suits me. I'm a writer. I don't really like to be out there very much. So the fact that you kind of fade into the background, I find kind of powerful in a curious kind of way. So I don't mind that. But it is the ridiculing and the sense that you have nothing to say because you have outlived your usefulness as a bearer of children. Yeah. Uh, so that's what annoys me most. And the only way I believe that we are going to turn that around is to become something that people look at and think, oh, my, that's really that's really cool. That's really wonderful. And young women, particularly, that they look at older women for once and see something that they really want to grow into, that they want to become and that gives them hope for you know, for, for a future that you know, for many of us is, is comprised of decades of life that we wouldn't have had 100 years ago. So, yeah, that's really that's really the point of it all, I guess. And it's about creating something as an older woman that doesn't have to be the same as what we were. Because this, I think, you, like me, you see menopause as this transformation, as this natural stage in a woman's life that she goes through and that she will be different on the other side of it. But that doesn't mean that she's in any way less or worse than she was pre-menopause because it's only that's one stage of our life. We weren't fertile up until puberty. Then then we're fertile for some years and then we're not fertile and we have a whole other life. And uh, that's that's what I love about what you're doing, because you're giving you're giving inspiration and you're giving models that women can model. They can, they can take those archetypes those images that you present and can think okay how does that fit with who I am now how can I take that and adapt myself in a particular way and not feel overwhelmed by this I'm no longer of any value narrative which just drives me nuts <laughs> yeah for sure me too and it uh, and and that's you know as someone who who has not had children herself it drives me nuts all the way through my life but particularly now um and I think you know, my perspective on that derives very much from depth psychology and from Carl Jung um, and, and my kind of training in psychology. And, and he was very clear that for, for all people, not just for women, the first half of life is very much outward focused. You know, it's about creating, building, growing stuff, houses, kids, if you have them, family, relationships, whatever. And that that's the role, in a sense, of the first half of life. But the second half of life is different. Something happens to us in midlife or menopause um, and particularly for women it's particularly strong I think because of the physical changes that accompany it and that will not let us ignore it and the second half of life then is about turning more inwards um, to, to look at what on earth this is all for who you are when all of the trappings are stripped away what is that unique gift that you have which I believe everybody has that you know, that can, what were your own unique way of being in the world that nobody else has? How can you use that for good? How can you grow? And I, you know, I've always believed that transformation is the entire purpose of life. If we haven't changed in the second half of our lives, then probably something has gone a bit wrong. Yeah, but that's the message we need to get out to women because so many women, they cling on to who they were because that's what we've been taught and that's what mm. we're sold. That's the messages we're sold, isn't it? That we have to retain our youth, retain our youthful beauty. We can't evolve into our elder beauty. Um, I don't know. Exactly. It's 
so frustrating, isn't it? It is. I'm, and and yeah. that's really, you know, that's one of the things that frustrates me. So uh, particularly now when everybody is congratulating themselves about how it is that menopause is being spoken about more and menopause is being pitched in a positive way in the media and what have you. And for me, it isn't. It's been oh, pitched as something Sharon, that... thank you. <laughs> well, it is, isn't it? It's everywhere. It's just I like this but idea. It, but it, again, but it's... It's the hang on. It's it's yeah. take the hormones yeah. so that you can stay how you were exactly instead of becoming who you're supposed to become. Oh, exactly, yeah. and, and instead of growing, and we learn nothing if that's what we're trying to do at all. And what I I am profoundly disinterested in that, both as a psychologist and as a human being. I want to know always what I can grow into, you know, what, yes, what, what's yes. better down the road. <laughs> yes. And I really do think, as many of the women that I've spoken to think, that once you get past 40, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're lucky enough to be able to make changes in your life and if you're lucky enough to have gotten the message, it really does get better. You know, I know I'm yeah. 61 now, so I know, you know, bits begin to break not quite to drop off, but some days you wish they would when they hurt. And, you know, so there is inevitably the difficult aspect of growing older, the, the physical decline. But even that is a learning experience. I don't mean that in a glib way. That's an awful cliche, isn't it? But it is. It's about it's about understanding the body and what it is to be an embodied animal effectively in a way that you could perhaps, again, if you're lucky enough to be healthy, you could perhaps ignore for, for, for most of your life. Now, everything, everything is about the body and what we can do and physical ability or not. And that informs your relationship with the land. It informs your spirituality, if you have one. It informs everything. And it's fascinating. I think it's fascinating. And I think certainly the, the the journey that I've been through midlife um I've learned so much but I've learned to listen mm. and I'm still learning to listen and I have to listen to my body and I think that's I was talking this morning with somebody talking about the process of death and dying and the fact that we have removed ourselves from the process of death and dying and you talk about that in in Hagitude as well but we've sanitized it we've medicalized it and we've done that with menopause as well first of all we've tried to distance ourselves from it whereas what I've learned is that the more I embraced it the more I sank into it and really embodied it the stronger I became and I think that's also sort of so many of the, the messages in your book about listening to the earth listening to the universe mother nature whatever it is that somebody's something's trying to talk to you even if it you, you know, if it's your inner mentor whoever it is from a psychological standpoint we have to get better at listening. And then your clarion call in Rose Rooted in terms of the earth is crying and we need to listen to the earth and, and step forward and do something. So there's there's so much there. I'm I'm waffling again, but I'm just sort of I just I think that this this need to stop, to pause. I talk about um menopause in my book, I suppose it's thinking about me. It's about learning to say no. And it's learning to pause, to stop, to think, not to be me no pause as in what the supplement companies say, you know, I'm not going to stop. I'm just going to keep going like the Duracell bunny, you know, because I'm frantic. <laughs> but um, that when we stop and we connect with life and the world and what's going on, that can be so powerful, can't it? It can. And, you know, in Haggitude, I present it as a time between stories and you know, yeah. the old story that we were talking about, the first half of life and the second story, the second half of life. If you don't stop, you will you don't make space for a new story to grow and you don't make space for a new way of being in the world to develop. And it isn't always the luxury that people present it as. You know, there are various ways of stopping. It doesn't mean give up your job and just sit in the dark mm -hmm. and drum for six months. It means just, as you say, slow down, listen more, be more reflective and don't rush all the time to become something to see what wants to grow because I, I don't I, I don't think 
it ever fails in midlife. I think that's what we're supposed to do. And I think if we just make space for the process, it, it comes along automatically. And in the context of death and dying, I think it can only be a culture that is terrified of death that insists on clinging so desperately to youth when it clearly has gone. You know, that is the, the symptom of a culture that is frightened of death. This kind of eternal youth syndrome that is foisted upon us all when that is the only thing that is valued and the only kind of wisdom that that um, that, that is honoured. And it, it is dysfunctional. It is insane. And yeah, we have to start accepting it as, as the natural and inevitable end of our journey into elderhood. That is the end of the journey. It's going to happen to us all. And if we're trying to live that journey as if that isn't the ending, then we are not going to be functional or authentic or live a life that is in any way meaningful. And in Haggitude, you know, I write a little bit about my own experience of a, um, of a serious illness. I had a very aggressive form of lymphoma a couple of years ago, which seems to have been solved now. Um, but that coming face to face with death in a very real way for the first time was a completely transformative experience that I would not give back to you. It made everything make sense, you know, and uh, it, it just, we all, we, not everybody clearly needs to get a disease that might kill them in order to do that, but we need to find ways of befriending death in this culture rather than mm. just kind of like trying to lock it up in a little black box and hope it hope it doesn't happen until it does yeah. inevitably yeah yeah because none of us get out alive do we indeed <laughs> it's just not gonna happen right i know but i yeah it's fascinating i was going to ask you about actually the the journey through the valley of death it was very very powerful and uh we you're right we we need these things to to wake us up i think to possibility and to wake us up to time as well. I'm I'm a big believer in those. Um, I know they're a bit naff, the online death clocks. But when you put when you put your stats in and you find out when you're actually going to die, or when the computer algorithm thinks you're going to die, it can be quite a salutary experience. Sort of like, okay, right. If I want to do something, I better get on and do it. Yeah, uh, it's partly about that, I think, and also partly about polarities in the sense that again at the risk of sounding awfully cliche ju just as you can't really appreciate the light unless you've experienced the dark I don't think you can appreciate life unless you have some understanding of death um it just is it, it's just necessary yeah yes. and, it, and it is the greatest teacher of all I think death mm -hmm. in, in whatever way you are able to come to terms with it or forced to come to terms with it. Yeah. So changing tack slightly, what can women do to change the narratives about how we are seen as we get older? Live them differently um, is the very simple answer. And again, that's what I'm trying to do in, in Hagitude is to provide examples of of, of the roles of older women, which matter, not just to the culture, but to ourselves, interesting ways of being. And so, you know, we if we look back at the stories, we have older women, clearly like the fairy godmothers who are mentors of, um, of children. We have wise women who have a depth and insight into the way the world is and the way the world works that can only ever come out of increasing age. Uh, we have the Kaya figures, who are the guardians and protectors of the land. We have um, the tricksters and the truth tellers, who are also really important, and particularly in our culture today, when um, that seems to be increasingly problematic, <laughs> if I can put yes. it that diplomatically. <laughs> um, you know, we have we have the harbingers of death, and we have the midwives of death. Uh, we have all of these different ways. We have the creators, the the women who literally weave the world into being. So we have. Oh, all I of love these... that. Yeah, uh, that's, the, there's the story so many you tell of them. about that and the the spiders and the yeah. web. That oh, was really beautiful. But there's so mm. many old women like that, and it is absolutely fascinating that if you look through European culture, it is 
always the old women, and they are old women, who have who who effectively keep the balance of the cosmos together. So if you look at the fates in Greek mythology, yeah. that was what they did. They weren't just, you know, dealing out destiny to people for the sheer hell of it. They were actually looking at what was needed to keep the universe in balance. And if somebody took more than they were supposed to take, everything went out of kilter. So they had to step in and make some adjustments. The Norns in Scandinavian mythology, you know, you have all of these wonderful characters. They're all old women. That's where that's where the knowledge lies to keep everything in balance and in harmony. And I think once we begin to understand that and we start to investigate the, what you know what the nature of an elder woman's wisdom is, we find all kinds of richnesses. So that's how we can do it, I think, by by choosing to live differently in ways that that bring out those qualities. Of elder women, and Baba Yaga. Tell tell, tell <laughs> us tell us about Baba Yaga because I'd yeah. never encountered her before. Had you not? Um, it always surprises she, me no, when people never. haven't. Uh, but there are a lot of people who haven't. Well, she's a Russian. I say Russian. She is in the Slavic, the wider Slavic tradition, and she is a dangerous old woman who clearly is derived from um, a one-time goddess. Um, but in most of the stories, she would be portrayed as a kind of, you know, wicked old witch. But she isn't in, in the original folklore, Baba Yaga. So she lives in the forest, in the heart of the forest by herself. She's an old woman. She lives on a house with chicken legs, which can run away if she feels like changing where she is. And the house on chicken legs is surrounded by um, a fence with skulls on top. And there are candles inside the skulls. And she flies through the air in some stories in a in a mortar with a pestle to kind of like a row to kind of like row away through the air, but that all sounds very trivial and very cutesy. But but actually she is a, she is the the dangerous old woman archetype. So children, young people go to her looking for something. In the most famous story, there's a young girl called Vasilisa who goes looking for fire because her family has run out and she's been sent there for fire. But she doesn't just get given fire, she has to earn the fire. And so Baba Yaga sets her tests. If she doesn't, or any of the other young people that go there, if they don't pass those tests, they get eaten. She has a man-sized oven in her kitchen, so the stakes are really high. And this character who is wonderfully vivid and funny character is a little bit ambiguous because on the one hand she's going to eat you if you don't do you know what she wants you to on the other hand she is what she is the character that promotes you your growth who prompts you to be the very best that you can become and that's what I love about her because of that ambiguity and you know we all have ambiguities there is no light without the darkness and she kind of personifies that so beautifully so yeah probably one of apart from the Kalia my second favorite old woman I would say and is she the inspiration for the witch in Hansel and Gretel do you think there are lots of characters like that it's really very interesting if you go back to old European mythology you can trace over time the process by which these older goddess figures who you know people talk about the great mother in European mythology and cosmology actually it was the great grandmother a lot of the time they were older women and you can trace the ways in which these older women became demonized and vilified clearly by a very patriarchal religion and Christianity but also patriarchal culture outside of religion and they were turned into wicked old witches and that brings me back again to that concept of the word hag because what the hag does as well as absolutely you know being herself not being defined by relationships is she often stands outside the culture looking at it and judging it and intervening in it and the men don't like that because if you stand outside the culture you're not confined by it. You're not bound by it. You're free. And I suspect that that is why we see these characters who were once powerful goddesses just being turned into rather nasty, wicked old witches who, of course, are always overcome by the good man at the end of the day. <laughs> I thought that was fascinating, actually, um, looking at um, your analysis of the patriarchal religions in Rose, women rose rooted because I looked at it in terms of menopause and I looked at how it's particularly bad in Protestant cultures um, the, the intersection of sexism and ageism 
um, and that that goes back to Protestantism and the value of a person being linked to their ability to work. So therefore the women didn't work, therefore they had less value. And as you got older, you could work less, so you got less value. So the women got the double whammy right. of the lack of value. But actually, if you look at current cultures, if you look at Catholic countries, women have more status So in, in as they get older. So in France, in Spain, in Italy, older women have more status than they do here. There's less pressure on them to get all the treatments, do everything to make themselves stay looking young. They can be beautiful when they're older. And then if you go further afield into East Asia, you get, you know, completely different dynamic there and in Africa and in Asia and Muslim countries. It's all very, very different. But this also relates, I, I thought it was fascinating that you talked about the patriarchal religions. And I hadn't really thought about that, you know, that when you grow up in Christianity or Islam or Judaism, they are all patriarchal religions. And still and today, yet, yeah. Yeah, and still today. And yet if you go back, as you have done, and look at the traditions, it wasn't like that. And if we'd gone off down a different route and we hadn't had all these patriarchal religions, it might have been very different. And women now might be in a completely different place, which is exactly what, what you're writing about, which I find absolutely fascinating. Yeah, so it is kind you. of interesting. I mean, you know, Orthodox Christianity, the head of that church is called the patriarch. I mean, go figure, you know, it, it, yeah. it's inbuilt into these mm -hmm. systems that women mm -hmm. are not allowed the same kind of status. They couldn't possibly be talking to God or be a messenger of God. <laughs> Whereas in, in the older cosmologies, pre-Christian, women were the centre of cosmology. Women were the mediators of otherworldly nourishment, energy, gifts, and, and what have you. And it's a really strong turnaround. And, you know, there is room clearly for a balance here. We don't want a matriarchy, I don't think, any more than we want a patriarchy, although some days I do take that back. <laughs> <laughs> but, Be nice but, for a change. Yeah, well, we, I just, wouldn't mind giving it a go. It. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> just to see what happened for a little while. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the the balance is 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 the trick, I think, and and it's really very interesting, you know, that in in the context of of the length of human history, these patriarchal religions and the ways that we treat women now perhaps are are only a very small proportion of time. Um, it, it isn't impossible to undo, but but in order to undo it, we have to get women believing that different ways of being in the world are possible and not only possible but fun i know but we have to also inspire women with confidence to believe that they can do these things because when you've had one message all your life it's so hard isn't it and you're, you're basically you're swimming against the current you are but i think there is an interesting thing that happens to a lot of women who've kind of accepted it not necessarily meekly but but just because they've thought that that's the way things are and then that old menopausal alchemy comes along yeah. and burns all of you know all of the crap away and then you're just not having it anymore and I've seen that happen to some really quiet women who go through that classic menopausal rage you know they're channeling the furies in Greek mythology and then they come out of it thinking hmm, okay there are different ways of being so menopause will do that for us for sure if we let it, won't it? Yeah, I love that about menopause. I mean, yeah. I sometimes I think I'm, I'm menopause's biggest fan. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I was given a diagnosis of early menopause at 41. Wow. And, right. um, you know, that sort of set me off on a on this path that I've gone down. And um, I was just curious. I wanted to know what was going on. Um, for a time, I got my periods back by changing the way I lived. I've just been very conscious that we have so much more control over our experience of it. It's not just something that happens to us. It's almost something that happens for us, you right. know, and, and we can make of it what we want. And it's radically changed my life for the better. I mean, it's just, I, and that's kind of what I want women to know. And, and I love your book and your premise that, you know, there is this whole exciting other chapter. If we can, 
find the examples to model if we can find the confidence to row against the current if we can do all of that indeed there is lots of possibilities there are lots of possibilities and there are clearly some some of them out there in what we might we might call the real world i'm not sure i always would there are plenty of you know older women role models out there but i do think that if we look at stories we find a wider range of possibilities yeah so between you know the the strong older women the doris lessings and the joanna macy's and all of the people that i talk about in the book who are out there doing really good work there are a whole bunch of 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 story characters who offer up different even different ways of being in the world and what did you discover about yourself by writing haggitude so I suppose that every book that you write tells you something about yourself, if, particularly if you're writing a memoir-related piece of work, because you're looking back on things that you've done and things that you have been in whatever way you can conjure up to be objective. And certainly when I was writing If Women Rose Rooted, I discovered so many things about my life and the way that I'd looked at it, the way I'd approached it, that I just really hadn't thought of before. It was kind of a form of therapy. I think with Haggitude, there was less of that because by the time I started to write it at about 58, I'd already done a lot of that work, you know, in If Women Are Rooted, and I had gone through menopause and was coming out the other side. But I did feel at some points, particularly when close to the beginning of the process, I ended up with a really profound inflammatory arthritis, having always been really well throughout my life and then that being associated with an aggressive form of lymphoma which came in later I did feel that some Baba Yaga character up there was cackling wildly in the sky saying hmm you thought you knew all about elderhood we're going to show you a few new tricks (laughs) so I guess I guess the learning for me was very much about the things that we've been talking about about coming to terms with the limitations of 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 an aging body, which I hadn't really, you know, I was still running around like a mad thing up hills and across mountains and what have you at that time. And the ability to befriend death rather than tolerate it when you're faced to make that walk through her place. Uh, so those were really the learnings that were very specific around Haggitude, yeah. And I discovered that I did very much love life and the work that I was doing, but if it came to this position where, you know, I wasn't going to enjoy it very much longer, I would think that that had probably been a a life relatively well lived, which is quite a big thing to discover. You know, I'd spent a lot of time deconstructing my life and, oh, you shouldn't have done that and you should have done that and that was a wrong, you know, a wrong path and you made a mistake there, but actually looking back on it, which one does, in these situations, it's like, no, that, that was OK. I'd like to do more, though, if I can hang around for a bit longer. <laughs> yeah, well, have you got another book then? Are you planning oh, for sure. One? Oh, for sure. At least one. At least one. <laughs> Has it already started? Yes. Now you're, going to, you're, now you're going to want to know about it, aren't you? <laughs> no, no, well, you're not going to tell me probably, but is it fiction or non-fiction? Um, I want to write both, but, I have a, but I'm, I'm beginning to work on a book um, which is roughly entitled Motherlands, but probably won't be called that, which oh. is about, about the ways and how, how the ways in which we are mothered impact our ability to belong um, to our bodies, to the world. It's really about being a daughter, so I'm a little bit tired, I suppose, about books of, of books about motherhood because I haven't experienced it. I don't have children and many of my friends really seem to feel that if you don't have children, you, you're almost trapped in the role of a permanent daughter. You know, you never quite feel as if you've grown up uh, or if you're allowed to have grown up. And so I'm really interested in this this idea of of daughterhood and and of belonging in in a wider sense. And I think I'll probably leave it at that. Otherwise, I'll give a little bit too much away and it might change. I wasn't I wasn't <laughs> expecting to get that much. So thank you. That's I will want to read that one. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. So um, that's just amazing. Thank you very much. So what as, as we wind up, what what do you most want women to know? 
I want women to know that we are incredibly valuable and necessary to the world. And I want them to know that each one of us has a way of being and a way of representing womanhood, for want of a better word, that is unique and necessary. And I, I do really, and I don't want it to sound cliched, but I, I really think of all of us in in the context of a garden metaphor, you know, because a lot of women think, well, the only way that you can make a difference in the world, the only way that you can matter in the world is to be the big showy rose bush or, you know, the big flowering tree or something like that. But if you look at a garden, it's the undergrowth that actually shelters a lot of the wildlife and a lot of the organisms that are necessary for the soil to be fertile to let the other flowers grow so there are the you know front of border gaudy flowers there are the bushes there are the trees there are all of these things that give a garden structure and without any element it would be a much less interesting place and so I want women to know that you don't have to save the world in order to be important in it and in order to matter and to just find a way of being in it that reflects what you think your gift is and who you are rather than constantly as we often do when we're younger try to be somebody that we're not because the culture has told us that's the best way thanks for listening to this episode of the magnificent midlife podcast if you enjoyed it please subscribe follow and share it also giving a five-star review really helps get the word out You'll find the show notes at magnificentmidlife.com. That's also where you can get my book, Magnificent Midlife, Transform Your Middle Years, Menopause and Beyond. Make the very best of your next chapter. Help me change the world, one magnificent midlife woman at a time.